I never start my presentation with a question mark. It's really the first time, and when I was invited to speak here, I thought, let's really think about what is it that I do. I don't want to jump straight into presenting my work and uh, sharing with you my portfolio and sharing with you. I want to really think for a second about why. Why am I doing what I'm doing? What is it that I'm doing? What is multidisciplinary? What does it really mean? Why does client come to us? Why they don't go somewhere else? Um, and all those questions made me really realize that a question mark is what I should have on the screen for the next few minutes. And then I'll still show you my work. Um, but what does multidisciplinary mean? Who is this guy that designed islands and architecture, sneakers, luggage, bags, um, chairs and toys? And how does he do all those different things? Isn't all those different things our speciality on their own? Um, and I really realized that when you think about design, everything is design. Everything that nature did not create, we created. If it's the language we're speaking, the font that we're reading, the buildings we're in, the subway, any type of transportation, any, anything that is around us was designed by somebody. So really, design is everything. So once I realized that, I, I realized there are enormous amount of specialists out there. There's enormous amount of people that have a particular interest and they give a particular value. So cross-disciplinary is something that is what exactly? Am I a generalist? Uh, because nobody goes to a generalist to fix a problem, or nobody goes to a generalist to uh, get a specific result. Then I realized that people, clients are looking for two different things sometimes. So they go to specialists very often because they know what they want. Uh, they need a certain things done a certain way, and that's the result. So what does that mean for those who practice innovation and try to actually look at different disciplines that can cross and fertilize one another and bring things that sometimes are unexpected, um, coming from, from, from different areas. And this is where I realized that I didn't really start my career when I finished school. My career started when I started thinking, when I started looking and questioning things and absorbing how we look at the life we live in. Why is this thing done a certain way? Can we look at them differently? Can we think about them differently? So when I started my company, I started charging for it. But before that, I was already thinking like that. Um, today, 12 years later, um, we are actually thinking and realizing that the best strength of what we are doing is in what we've never done before. And that's something that is quite difficult to explain to a client, um, that you haven't done what they're asking you to do, but that's the strength. The strength is that I never actually had knowledge that limit me in terms of thinking and imagining um, something new, something different for that particular need. We are a transformable being. We're constantly changing. We're constantly desiring different things, um, feeling different things. We are poetic and practical. We are desiring things that are essential, and we're desiring things that are luxurious. About a year ago, we realized that my studio is limited. And the amount of specialists that we have in our studio is often not enough for the projects that we are practicing. So we realized that in a dream scenario, all of the people that were constantly collaborating, because we always bring people that specialized in something to help us, in a dream scenario, all those people will be with us in our space at any given time. We don't need to call them, email them, schedule a time, make sure that they are free. So we decided to start something quite interesting, which now has been four months. It's a, it's a space that we took, which is a 13,000 square foot space for about 220 people. And we invited all of the people that we are constantly uh, 
working with the, 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 the different people from design industry in New York to share the space with us. So whenever each one of us needs to interact and to work with people that have particular knowledge of different kinds of parts of design from architecture, structure engineers, animators, motion graphic, they are there. And it's been so incredibly successful for us and we call it We Cross, We Cross Design Discipline. Uh, so our studio right now is about 10, in a way, directors that leads different projects for different things and we're constantly collaborating. Collaboration is really part of what I always uh, think it's important for us to, um, to move forward with, especially if we are constantly thinking about design and cross-disciplinary somewhat like a child, very naive, very almost the opposite of being professional, almost the opposite of really thinking, okay, there is a problem here, this is the way to fix it. The process is never linear. So when people say, oh, what's your process? How do you start? Do you sketch and then you have uh, ideation, then you do research? It's not really like that. It's very difficult to explain the design process when you're thinking about innovation, when you're searching for something that is unexpected, you have to always go and, like you're saying, think outside the box. You need to actually create different path. Um, you know, it's, it's, I always compare it to when you open up the fridge and you're expecting to find something there, and then you open it again, hoping that there is something else that you haven't seen before. I do that all the time. So it's really not a problem. It's just because we can imagine that something else will be there and next time we're opening, we're hoping that our reality actually created and it's there. So it's the same like our um, way of thinking of every challenge. We're trying to imagine, we're trying to put the knowledge aside for a minute to really think about what is it that could happen? What is this dream that can create this maybe? Everything I do is always, is never static. Um, I'm going to start in showing you a few projects. I want to focus at the end on two very important projects for me that have not, some of them are not being realized yet. But I'm going to start with some smaller stuff. Uh, this is actually our first product in the market. Um, the Vaso Phases for Rosenthal. The idea started basically with taking an iconic form into the worst experience a vase can have and breaking it to highlight the beauty of experience, to highlight the beauty that the experience is actually what's unique about uh, who we are. Metaphorically, the path we're taking ourselves in life is, um, is basically the beauty of who we are. So I always try to, if I can, divide my work somewhat. It's sometimes metaphorical and sometimes physical. Um, this chair, which we've been working with for quite some time now and actually going to release a new version of it very soon, is a chair that intended to rethink about folding chairs. Why do we actually put folding chairs in our closet? Um, why do we let our guests sit on a chair that we're not proud of, that we're actually hiding, that we're actually putting away? So what if actually the chair that we're giving our guests is the art that is on our wall? And when it's not being used, it's actually art. It's actually two-dimensional. So here we realize that all we created is actually a canvas with hinges. Uh, it's basically um, uh, 2D becomes 3D art versus functionality. And, uh, and then we realize it's just a canvas. So we invited different artists to do different things and have their interpretation of, of, uh, of what it means. This is my first collaboration with um, Capellini. And here, for the first time, I didn't really think about creating a chair. I was thinking about the beauty of a peacock, the beauty of an animal that actually open up his feather for two completely different reasons, one which is attraction and the other which is um, defense. And really thinking about those two different things, this tension, this complete opposite, is something that I always love. And this is, for me, always part of transformation, always part of two extremes that come together. So the idea was to try to find the material felt that doesn't actually have structural strength to hold the person, but just because of those folds, 
that are on a simple metal frame are able to actually keep this chair together. And then about seven years ago, or six years ago, I started thinking about architecture more and more. I was quite intimidated with architecture at first because I didn't study it. Um, and when people ask me, are you an architect, are you a designer? Uh, usually it's a question that bothers me a little bit because you know, what is knowledge? Where do we accumulate knowledge? We can accumulate it through the ordinary uh, schools and academias, and we can also um, accumulate knowledge on our own and through experiences. So when people said your work is very architecture, I didn't know exactly what it means until I sketched a simple house on my sketchbook, and I thought, why does every kid that I know draw a house like that? Um, and so I went to some textbook and I realized that an A-frame is a very strong structure and it's very advantageous in climates that are cold, snow loads and so forth. And I thought a place like New York that have a very cold winter but also a very warm summer, what if I can put this uh, pitched roof on a hydraulic piston just like a garbage truck and actually change the icon from winter to summer? And um, and what I realized is that this was the first time that I thought about the same transformation that I'm doing in product in a larger scale. So then really architecture starts to become uh, an important part of our studio with the first international commission that is now being completed uh, in Abu Dhabi. I'm gonna quickly go through this because this is the first time I actually realized the importance of a seed of an idea. And where does things start? So nobody comes to a design studio, product design studio for the most part, and says we have a $1.2 billion budget. What would you do with it? Um, so the first conceptual approach was let's see what they can do. Let's just let them think. They gave us a very simple brief. They said, we have an island off the coast of Abu Dhabi. It's about 135,000 square meter. We want it to be luxurious. 2007, everything was all about how can we create luxury hotels, residential, and I found myself doing a master plan for the first time, not really knowing what I'm doing, and I'm thinking, luxury, what does that really mean? for that particular setting. Once I realized that, why would you buy a house on an island and have 16 neighbors from the left and 14 neighbors from the right, wouldn't you want to live on this island on your own? So maybe luxury means privacy? Uh, in that particular setting, I thought that all I know from the Persian Gulf is carpet making. So I thought, what if, like we always say, lift the carpet and shove things underneath. What if I can think about the island like this? What if, what if the island is this massive carpet, this massive vegetation that can hide uh, different things underneath it? So think about it like this vegetation that all the architecture is placed underneath. So when you're on your roof, you don't really see anything uh, above you. And that was the approach. That was the main approach is to camouflage everything, both the hotel and the rest of the residents. And we found ourselves building this conceptual presentation, presenting it to the crown sheikh of Abu Dhabi, and he's saying, I love it. I want to build this. So I just started laughing hysterically at this point, and I said, well, I have no idea how to build this. <laughs> I've never done anything like this before. And that time, this client said to us the smartest thing I've heard from a client till this point, which was exactly what we were telling our client, is that it's okay. We know that you don't have the um, capability of undertaking this project on your own, but we can pad you with the knowledge that you're lacking. We can bring the specialist that can make this vision happen. A week later, we pretty much started this commission, which we got approximately six months to finish the design and open the sales office, which opened in May of 08. And basically, 72 hours later, $876 million of sale have 
happened. And for me, that basically meant one thing. It's the power of the idea. The power of the idea that can generate a lot and can roll a snowball that can just grow and grow and grow. And for me, this project proved it because in every meeting, from structure engineers to dredging engineers, everybody was always referring to this carpet. Everything has to be hidden. Everything has to be um, underneath this vegetation. So then I realized that design can do a lot more to the world we're living in. About six years ago, we started working on a geometry that today we're calling a quadror. And that is probably one of my biggest passion at the moment, something I strongly believe in because I didn't know what I'm getting into when I started. Um, it started with this chandelier for Swarovski and from this chandelier, I discovered a form that I'm very, very, very passionate about. It's basically four identical pieces that are cut in a very particular way. So you have three parallel surfaces on each side, which basically makes for this kind of like, a, I call it the square yin-yang. Um, when you put two of them facing down and two of them facing up, in such a way that one side have a vertical orientation and the other side have a horizontal orientation, you will get four points that those pieces can intersect and connect to one another. So basically by connecting this piece to that piece and that piece to that piece, you get that. So once you put it down like this, it opens up. It opens up and creates this extremely strong <laughs> Thank you. extremely strong triangulation um, so for quite some time all I've done is this all I've done was basically putting it down and opening and closing and opening and closing and I was like what can you do with this there's something here I don't know exactly what but I just love it I just think it's interesting I think it's a hinge, but it's not really a hinge. There is an A from one side, there's a V on the other side, it's identical from all four sides. So we started making things. We just started making things in different size and in different scale, and we just realized stuff, and we start collecting information and collecting data and collecting questions. What if, what if, what if, what if? And then we invited some structural engineers and we start asking them those questions. And they start validating some of our questions. They said it's ridiculously strong. It's very, very, very structural. What can we do with it? So we started looking at two different um, categories, if we can call it like this. One which is the solid uh, pieces like that, done in different sizes. And we realized that one of the biggest advantages are acoustics. When the triangulation goes in and out like this, it's great for absorbing acoustics. So can we think about it as a highway? Can we think about it as a retaining wall that um, can basically be deployed extremely easy because it's made out of an identical form that can be molded and cut, and now we're actually optimizing this out of all kinds of manufacturing techniques. But the first time we've made this concrete block, which is about a meter by meter, the engineer said that this piece can support 86 pieces identical to that on top of it. Of course it will collapse, but in terms of structural, uh, of course it will tip over if it's on its own, but in terms of structural load, the strength of this unit is pretty much equivalent to a solid block of concrete, but just using 20% of the material. So there's, so there's saving, there's uh, a lot of advantages, and we just didn't really know how do we take it to the next level? What do we do with this? Who do we speak to? Um, today, we're, work, we're working with Punj Lloyd on trying to realize some of those, but prior to that, art and installation was always the form for us to try to realize things. There's a little bit of budget, we can test something, we can try something, we can make an installation, and later, later on that can fund something else for other purposes. Um, so that's the dividing part. The same thing happens when you're looking at this form with an open uh, surface in the middle. 
it's exactly the same. The two point, the four points are actually divided into two on each side. So when you're opening this structure, it becomes a, a type of a space frame, a space frame that is very strong, very deployable, and easy to make because it's essentially made out of this articulating joint in the corner and, and uh, vertical and horizontal members. So we started looking at different compositions and different ways of aggregating this geometry in order to create buildings of different kinds. Um, we are now looking at prefab homes, homes that can be deployed um, and Essentially, we realize that all we are doing is separating the structure from the skin. So the structure is completely independent, and then this building can be cladded differently. Then we thought, it's strong, it's cheap, it's easy to deploy. Can we really look at it as something that can support a more important need for areas where Structure engineers don't really validate the strength of homes and serve one purpose, really looking at just improving structural strength of a particular dwelling. So we looked at ways of simplifying it and simplifying it and how this thing can simply be a joint that can be deployed and everything else can be found locally. So all the cladings, all the ability to, to, to change and, um, and skin this thing can be done over time. So we're just providing one thing, and this is an ongoing effort for us. Uh, we realize that this geometry can be used in all kinds of applications, so we're calling it uh, a call for collaboration. Our strength is basically with whoever we're teaming with, and this has been always a, a, a proof to to what we do. Uh, so we call it Quadror. It's kind of like almost uh, in its own entity in our studio. It's its own um, effort. This project have changed a lot in my, uh, in my mind. And, you know, when I, when I worked on some of the architectural projects that we've done, I realized that you don't have to be an architect to make a change. You don't have to, um, you just really have to dream. I'll tell you the story about this project, which for me is kind of strange to even speak about because I felt very uncomfortable when I presented it for the first time because I was never thinking about something in that scale. Uh, this is our first urban planning for a city of 350 residents. I never thought about anything in that scale before, but when I went to Turkey for the first time and met with this developer that, um, that says, we are building, we're trudging a canal that will cut the city of Istanbul into two. I said, what? $40 uh, billion dollar worth of dredging land that is basically served to relieve some of the commerce that is right now on the Bosphorus, taking merchandise from the Black Sea to the Murmurates and back, um, and basically taking all the hazardous material away. They said, we have a billion cubic meter of land we don't know what to do with. And we want you to think about what can we do with this land? Let's imagine a place where all of this land can go to and create a city in the water that potentially challenges the 20th century cities that we live in right now. I didn't really know what to ask. I really didn't know what to think about this challenge. I didn't really know where to begin but I just realized that I traveled the world. It took me yesterday two and a half hours to get from the airport to the hotel. And that's not just here, that's everywhere. That's simply in every big city around the world right now. We have the same issues, less or more. We have traffic, we have pollution, we have issues with old structure and infrastructure that we don't really know how to deal with. So, Basically, what this guy is asking me is to imagine a futuristic city, 
a utopic city that is maybe interesting for us to think of right now. the cities that we're living today in, and we're thinking about buildings. Uh, I live in New York and I look out through my window and I see a building here and a building here and a building behind it. Um, and I'm thinking, is skyscrapers really the solution for our problems? Uh, and I don't think so. I, I think that skyscrapers are great for the problems that we have right now because we are basically can take the, you know, take advantage of, of, of height. But when you're thinking about buildings, there's something a little selfish. Um, they're basically plugged into a two-dimensional grid and they're just sucking energy and throwing out whatever uh, they don't need. They don't really share much. They don't really interact much with the building next to them. Besides the fact that each one of them needs to be self-supportive, so as higher you go, as more infrastructure you need for that, 
for, for just this one uh, building. Besides the fact that in our cities right now, we don't see much nature. We don't see much vegetation and greens and, um, you know, a lot of people that I know are basically having two homes. They have a house in the country and a house in the city just for that issue. I need to see some nature. I need to see some greenery. So I have everything double. I take my car on Friday. I go to the country. I come back on Monday. And here I work and here I play. And there's something weird about that. There's something that doesn't really make much sense for me. So how can we make our cities of the future integrating more nature and actually looking like we live in nature? This proposal is basically, the only thing we've done is looked at some previous interesting master plans that are circulars and have a center and have communities around it and basically just create this two-dimensional grid as a three-dimensional grid. So infrastructure is not just flat. Infrastructure is not just responding to the existing terrain, but it's actually moving up and creating um, something more harmonious, something that can actually share and interconnect. So there was one diagram, which I think is the most important one, which is, um, which is, it's no longer horizontal, it's no longer vertical buildings, it's horizontal buildings, buildings that are basically wrapping around. So the residentials are always looking out, which are always having these green terraces, and the communities, the commercial centers, and the commerce is basically happening inside. Um, you know, this geometry and the island have something in common. They both play with triangulations, which I uh, strongly believe in. We've, worked very closely with the Buckminster Fuller Foundation and with some of Bucky's partners, which um, help us realize why triangulation is strong. So this proposal is somewhat a mix of geodesic domes and tensile strength from the outside. So everything is triangulated. Everything is basically done in such a way that the infrastructure goes um, up and down. And that's, that's currently what I think of of our cities. Um, thank you very much.